Running water is favourable to daydreams and a strong tidal river is the best of running water for mine. I like to watch the great ships standing out to sea or coming home richly laden, the active little steam tugs confidently puffing them to and fro from the sea horizon, the fleet of barges that seem to have plucked their brown and russet sails from the ripe trees in the landscape. And those words were taken from Charles Dickens, The Uncommercial Traveller. I'm hearing them said as I stand along the banks of the River Medway, which may well have been where he saw those activities happening on this piece of water. And it's a way of us beginning a very special exploration of the Kent countryside, its waterways, its marshes, its landscape, because Kent had a vast influence on Charles Dickens's life. And that is what we're going to explore for this week's Open Country in this, his bicentenary year. And I'm doing that in the company of Vivian Boucher, who's a journalist and writer and a great Dickens fan, and Sandy Digby, who we heard read that extract. Uh, You're an actress and uh, you do tour guides around places like Rochester, where we're starting our journey from. We can start here, Vivian, can't we? Because Dickens was here when he was, you know, knee-high. Absolutely. It's one of the earliest memories that he had of living in Rochester. And he would come down to the river here and walk along the Esplanade and over the river towards Gad's Hill, which was an infamous area of local highwaymen who used to hold up the coaches going up over the hill towards Gravesend or indeed coming from Gravesend in the opposite direction to Rochester. And the place where Charles Dickens finally died. Indeed. So it began and ended in this, this place, this landscape. I wonder what the waterway would have been like when he looked out at it. Because what we have now, Vivian, we've got all these little pleasure craft anchored up along piers. You know, there are cranes on the skyline and factory buildings and, you know, the train trundles across the bridge. But I'm thinking of that boy, you know, possibly walking along with his father. What was happening between them? What was happening around Charles as as a youngster like that, that, you know, that he could remember so well and that influenced him so much? Well, one of the things that he could see was the old um, Hulk warships that had been decommissioned, anchored in the river. He used to go on excursions with his father down to Sheerness Dockyard. And these old warships, or hulks as they were called, used to house prisoners. And, of course, he remembered these hulks and used them as the place where Magwitch was imprisoned in Great Expectations, which he wrote in his later life. But he drew on these childhood memories of these... Um, sinister hulks with the convicts on board. So much of the city of Rochester had a part to play in Dickens' life and in his writings. It's quite hard to choose where to go next. So let's go up through the castle, past the great keep on our right-hand side, and beyond we've got the spire of the cathedral. And Dickens would have come in here... Yes, and the mystery of Edwin Drood was all based round the cathedral. So it's had a big impression on him. A very big because impression. That was at the end of his life that he wrote that. There's a piece he wrote in the mystery of Edwin Drood about Rochester Cathedral. Dear me, said Mr. Grugius, peeping in, it's like looking down the throat of old time. Old time heaved a mouldy sigh from the tomb and arch and vault, and gloomy shadows began to deepen in corners and damps began to rise from green patches of stone and jewels, cast upon the pavement of the nave from stained glass by the declining sun began to perish. All became grey and murky and sepulchral, and the creaked monotonous mutter went on like a dying voice until the organ and the choir burst forth and drowned it in a sea of music. so impressive you walk into this great open space in some ways and yet you have these solid uh, pillars that hold up the soaring roof above us and beyond at the far end of this space is the magnificent set of pipes that is the organ there are statues of saints carved there are carved memorials all along the walls or stained glass Um, I mean it's just it's simple but exquisitely beautiful. And it's in such contrast to where we're going to head to now, to the church at Cooling, which featured, of course, in 
great expectations. It's out on the marshlands of Kent. You so quickly leave the urban built environment behind and you come out onto the flat landscape around here, down towards the open marshes and on towards the River Medway. Um, but where I am now is very special because I'm in the graveyard which surrounds St James's Church in Cooling. This is such a famous location because it just draws you in that setting at the beginning of Great Expectations and Pip and Magwitch and where Pip is at these gravestones. We think these are them here, these lozenge tablets, these miniature child-sized sarcophaguses, really, aren't they, that, that sit proud on the ground. Just glancing at them, it almost brings a tear to your eye, mm. seeing all these lozenge-shaped graves, tiny little graves for children. John, I think you said they're not all from one um, generation. This is John Viger, who is with the Church's Conservation Trust. Um, it, it's quite frightening, isn't it? We are talking about the deaths of obviously some you know young children and Abs a lot of them absolutely um but as vivian said they all belong to one family but in fact it's a very spread out family and there are four different generations buried here and that's why i think in the book dickens says there are five of these memorials whereas in, in reality there are 13 and that's because they're an amalgam of lots of different local families do we know what these children died from? Well, they probably died from marsh fever, or the ague as it was known in these parts, and brought on by living in proximity to the marshes with the mosquitoes and, and the stagnant water down there. Remind us, Sandy, of what he wrote from here. This is the opening chapter of Great Expectations. At such a time, I found out for certain that this bleak place, overgrown with nettles, was the churchyard and that Philip Pirrip, late of this parish, and also Georgiana, wife of the above, were dead and buried, and that Alexander, Bartholomew, Abraham, Tobias and Roger, infant children of the aforesaid, were also dead and buried, and that the dark, flat wilderness beyond the churchyard, intersected with dikes and mounds and gates, with scattered cattle feeding on it, was the marshes. He goes on to say, and that the small bundle of shivers, growing afraid of it all and beginning to cry, was Pip. John, can we maybe go inside the church? Yes, let's go inside. Uh, when Dickens walked down to the, the church here, this was the, the goal, if you like, the place to come and get out of the hustle and bustle, because although we're in the country, it was a, a big, busy agricultural community. And just to step off the road and come into this wonderfully quiet space, as so many visitors do today, was something that Dickens would have savoured. And just describe it for me. I mean, I kn you know every inch of this church. It's a very simple 13th century church, very quiet, quite light, because the, the light shines from the south. And we've just got a, a vision through this 13th century arch into the chancel, which has got the most elaborate wall decoration you can imagine, made up of marble shafts and arches running down either side. And John, he would have passed this church as he walked out onto the marshes, that flat land that lies beyond, in a way, the safety and sanctity of this small church. Very much so. And even today, looking over the churchyard wall, you can picture the view that Dickens had. Well, John, that's what I'm going to head out on to now, to see, to get a picture of that landscape in Dickens's time and to see how, it, how it's really changed in some ways since then. When you hear about how you know, Dickens wrote about the marshes. The only way he could have done that is if he had walked out upon them, if, that he understood the wateriness, the muddiness of the environment, you know, the rise and fall of the tide, the pathways across the marshes. You know, it's very... How he wrote is how it is. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you couldn't make that up. And, of course, you'd have to know the marshes to walk out across them because they're a spectacularly hazardous place. So here I am with 
Rolf Williams of the RSPB and we've come down, well we're, we're walking towards the marshland. This particular area is called... This is Northwood Hill mm-hmm. and the hill of course slopes down onto the huge expanse that we can see in front of us now. In fact looking across onto the horizon into Essex and you wouldn't know that the River Thames was there mm-hmm. until a ship strangely <laughs> slides through a field of sheep That's and again right. that would have been the same in Dickens time. Uh, not so much a forest of oil refineries and fuel and a, and storage a depots. Yeah, mm-hmm. Canby Island and Tilbury, but a forest of, of masts, of all of these ships that in the same way were bringing all this trade up the Thames, this artery into London. And we've reached the viewing point. Um, <laughs> just miles and miles of flat land with occasional large pools of water um, with bird life on them. I can see the ones certainly that are closer to me. And then the land just stretches on and on and on. I mean, what, what sort of area are we talking about? Well we're looking across hundreds of hectares of land here and on a, on a clear day we can see from Canary Wharf now up in London all the way down to in fact South End is reaching out to the east of us there on the skyline. So it's a remarkable place and we have a skyline of the oil refineries there you can see power stations so a lot of influence of man and in fact even the pools in front of you are man made. These are our reservoirs in which we try to hang on to water to wet up the land so that breeding birds can come and feed in the softer muds here, whereas our neighbours continue to try and drain the water off the land so it's not too soggy for their livestock. So that, that's a, a, a big difference, is that since Dickens' time, much of the land has become much drier because we've got more efficient at holding the River Thames back. In his day, they were still relying on wattle and door barriers that would have first been put in by the Romans and then the Saxons, and they were still struggling, fighting to keep these storm surges of the North Sea and the Thames out. Um, but it was much, much wetter when Dickens was finding his inspiration walking out across those marshes. I think it's quite a fearful place, actually. Um, I mean, it's beautiful, but there's an eeriness about it. And I would... I mean, he was a great walker, didn't he? Yes. He walked miles oh, and yes. miles and miles for... And I wonder if he, he, if he experienced any fear out there or, or a sense of... You know, I'm going to get lost. It is literally a sea of grass. Now, when you're on the oceans, you know that that is a changeable environment. At a snap of your fingers, the wind can change, and suddenly the whole seascape is fearsome. But on another day, it's placid and peaceful. And the marsh is exactly the same. Uh, as we watch the seasons come and go, it changes from being such a welcoming place to go out and explore with the purring of turtle doves in the trees or in the winter the the flocks of of thousands of dunlin for example wheeling around like amoeba through the skies it's fantastic and inspiring you think wonderful and then suddenly the mist comes in it starts to get dark a bit sooner than you thought it might you're not quite sure where the path was you come suddenly across ditches full of of freezing cold dark water and and in an instant it feels very different and i think that's the the enduring appeal of the North Kent marshes is that changeability. Uh, nothing's ever static, whether it's the way we farm the land or what's happening in those few minutes with the... Like a man's life. <laughs>